always parked in the garage whenever. We're going to take a break of our review of testimony in the Lewis Toledo case out of Florida to bring another segment up for you. Many of you know that uh, I was a local reporter in Wisconsin in 2005 when a man named Stephen Avery was arrested on suspicion that he killed a freelance photographer named Teresa Halbeck. Well, we're still here talking about that case more than 10 years later. Colleen Henry was one of my competitors. She works at WISN TV in Milwaukee, as she has done for a number of years. She's here to spar with me yet again on the Law News Network. Colleen, it's always good to see you. Yeah, and actually on the eve of the anniversary of Teresa Halbach's homicide. You know, you mentioned that, and uh, it's funny that you bring that up because I hadn't thought to start there, but I will. Um, Halloween is frankly still a difficult time of year for me. I was not related to her. But covering this case around this time of year when the wind gets a little cold and there's a bite to the to the breeze and and seeing uh, the foliage fall it just brings me back to that time it's a very difficult time to report that story locally because yeah. she was a well-loved member of the community and uh, yet you've got a guy named Stephen Avery who all of us knew before he was uh, accused in this case you know, many of us had been to family celebrations on the Avery property. I had been there, been in and out of some of these trailers that we're still here debating about what was found right. in those trailers. So it, it's a, I mean, it's a bizarre situation. I think what a lot of people don't remember because it you know, was the focus of a little bit of your making a murderer fan at the upfront was the fact that he had become, um, you know, sort of a sensational headline himself in a very positive way in the sense that, uh, you know, he was uh, acquitted, not acquitted, but he was exonerated of, uh, you know, a sexual assault that he didn't commit, and he became the poster child for everything that's wrong with the criminal justice system, and he was actually a fairly, I thought, uh, effective advocate, you know, he went to the legislature in Wisconsin, and he met with the woman who accused him, and the two of them together, you know, asked the Wisconsin legislature to improve the systems that, you know, we all now kind of take for granted uh, in Wisconsin. It's, you know, the fact that you're going to have, especially if you're a juvenile, you're going to have a, a, a videotaped, I know, so you make your statement, it's going to be videotaped by the police, all kinds of um, reforms, you know. Well, it was, you know, they called it, wasn't a form law or something. I think it actually was named after Steve Avery. So, you know, it just, it was a very ironic twist of events that day, I'm sure you remember it because you were closer than I was in Milwaukee, but I can remember sitting in my corner in a hovel back here in the newsroom and somebody said, Steve Mary was the last guy to see Teresa Hallock and we, I, and I can't say what I said out loud because of course you probably have some FCC regulations about it. I was like, we're, oh. on, we're online so you can say whatever you want on law oh, news. Yeah, now, no, now on your station we couldn't say it, but uh, <laughs> but here because we're online, but, but we'll just leave it to the imagination. I was sitting on the anchor desk when it came out that Stephen Avery was the person of interest in the Halbach case. And I whipped around in my chair because in our studio, the assignment desk and the newsroom were right behind the, the desk. And I said, is this the Stephen Avery? Because I wanted to make sure it wasn't some other Stephen yeah. Avery. And they said, yes, it is. So I, at that point I started ad-libbing. And, and it was, you know, I don't know, I'm sure you had the same reaction I did, which was, no way. This guy's got, there's no way this guy would screw up you know, his potential multi-million, hundred million dollar settlement. Remember at that point he had that lawsuit pending and he had very good lawyers and he had all kinds of um, evidence that was really looking good for him in terms of a civil claim for wrongful conviction. So, exactly. you know, everybody's and, and thinking, oh. That's exactly what th went through my head. And, you know, I will admit that one of the few times I was scooped on the Stephen Avery case with relation to Teresa Hallbuck was that moment we were not the first ones to report that he was related to it and the reason why is because we actually had outperformed our competitors the day before <laughs> we actually did most of the interviews the night before because we had more nighttime reporters than the other stations so because they were following our tracks they did interviews the next morning and at that point that was after the friends and the investigators had gone through her phone records and found out that she was over at Avery's. Yeah. So it was my competitors who first reported that Stephen Avery was somehow attached to this, and I had a similar reaction to you. But look, we're here now, and we're here yet again because you and I will debate this perennially. Um, Kathleen Zellner has filed a, a new motion last week. I've been going through it and comparing it with the other 36,000 pages of records in this case. Right. And, you know, we had a motion from her seeking a new trial over the summer. 
it was denied in a rather cursory fashion, which she pokes fun of in this motion for reconsideration. And so, I, I, well, that's a gentle way to put it. She basically calls the judge an idiot. But. Well, that's, that's one way to paraphrase it as well. So look, apparently you and I need to have a thesaurus dinner conversation. We'll invite our families and come up with other words to, to use. But she's got this thing in the bottom of the motion. She's like, well, my motion is this many words and your response to it, judge, is only this many words and you only responded to 2.5% of my words and that left 97.5% of my accusations unexamined uh, by the court. It, it was snarky. And we can sit and laugh about it, but if you were trying this case and you were in her shoes, would you address a judge that way? You know, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the Bambi. <laughs> I'm gonna take that Bambi school of thought. You know, Thumper says, Mama says, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Um, but here's my thought about it. Um, she, yeah, yeah. You, you, you don't attack a judge, right? A judge who can. I would assume not. I mean, look, I mean, here's the thing. There's a decorum in court. And I know that she's trying to make a point, but I looked at that and said, okay, well, she scored debaters points. We're here talking about it. People reacted to it. But, um, you know, is there a reason why the court's initial response wasn't horrendously long? And from my perspective, having sat in a number of residency, res residencies, let me say that properly, in law school and whatnot, I know that these courts, the clerks are usually horribly overworked. They don't have time to write 50 page responses, 300 page responses. And frankly, that we're getting 50 and 300 page motions out of Stephen Avery's post-conviction attorney at this point, I know a lot of judges would look and say, hey, look, you get 20 pages, there's a page limit. Yeah, and it's like you when know, you go to the Court of Appeals, you got 20 minutes. Exactly. You know, you, you get a certain amount of time. You get a certain amount of time at the U.S. Supreme Court. The only case I can think of that went over it was uh, what the Obamacare decision. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, where they had almost an entire day of oral arguments about that case. So we've got that. Um, but let's get into some of the allegations. What do you make of this claim that there is another witness out there who suddenly has come forward? to claim that he saw Teresa Holbuck's vehicle in some other location a couple of different days the day after she's believed to have been murdered, October 31st, 2005. Do you think that there's any credibility to that? And I know I'm asking you to take your reporter's hat off and put on your analyst hat, but yeah, it's I, this know, many I'm years thinking, later. I'm comfortable asking, answering the question. So, uh, you know, as I like to say, you don't know what you don't know until you know it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, could, it could it happen? Mm -hmm. You know, I sure it's it's totally possible. And the fact that somebody has been sitting on information for all these years is remarkable, given especially in the last two years that there would have been this opportunity because there was you know because of making a murder, everybody was talking about it. And if you were the kind of person who um, finally you know was going to have some sort of guilt about not having come forward with this information, you know that would have been the time. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I mean, it, this is it's what you know. Kathleen Zellner has the benefit of you know, looking backwards, right? And she can go back and retrace all the steps that people didn't have time or resources to do. Uh, so it's possible there's somebody out there. It's it's hard to believe. Um, and it's very interesting. And I think it's also interesting, wasn't it, that, that, that Sergeant Colburn's name pops up again in, in this thing about having not... Uh, yeah, I mean, it, what are there, like two uh, deputies in Manitowoc County, it seems, because we get the same names coming up every time there's an accusation. But see, look, I agree with you that it's possible, theoretically, that this car could have been seen someplace else. That's one thing. Okay, theoretically, it could have happened. Second of all, I always assumed at the time, and I don't know if you had this same suspicion, Colleen, or not, especially after the Dassey case. I remember standing there that night. I think you were there when the verdict came down. I think we were on different sides of the courthouse. Mm -hmm. Okay, or maybe we were close enough by, but we were just so busy doing our job that, you know, it's not like we were comparing notes. We were competing at the time. Right. But something told me uh, that at some point, something else was going to come out about this 
that somebody was going to know something that they weren't saying, that they were afraid to say, either because of the defendant, the defendant's family, or because of the police and uh, you know the tight-knit nature of uh, more rural police communities. I couldn't quite get it out of my system that somebody else knew something mm-hmm. that eventually would come out. Is this it? I don't know. But I had that suspicion, did you? Well, I think the other thing that was interesting in the, uh, the latest you know, edition, that the stuff that I don't remember hearing at the time, uh, was what we had heard that obviously we knew that Steve Avery's brothers were, you know, convicted felons and for, for sex-related crimes. Uh, so, you know, when this first happened, it was sort of like, well, heck, anybody on that compound could have committed this crime. Uh, and then you had DNA, which was able to sort of, you know, narrow it down and say, no, it was it was Stephen Avery, not one of the other brothers. Now we have this uh, Dassey situation where now we've got, uh, you know, the, suggesting that perhaps they had the wrong Dassey brother, you know, as opposed to Brendan. It was yeah, that, that's, Bobby, I wanted to, um, I wanted to get into that in a second, Colleen, but I, I want to dial back a little bit to the car here first because I wanted to ask you about this. Now, I know you're down in Milwaukee, so you're not actually transmitting directly to the area in Manitowoc County. That was that was our turf. I was working right. in Green Bay. You're working in Milwaukee. Um, and what sort of bothers me about this new accusation that this witness has apparently come forward saying, oh yeah, I saw Teresa Holbuck's vehicle. It was at this, you know, near this dam of some sort. I, I haven't looked at the map yet to figure out exactly where it was. Um, and, and we're looking at the pictures on the screen of when Holbuck's vehicle was ultimately found at the salvage yard, which is the state's theory that the vehicle was at the salvage yard and uh, that it entered the salvage yard on the 31st and that it never moved. So Mm -hmm. to say that it was someplace else would just be a huge bombshell. But but here's what, here's what bugs me about this, Colleen, is, is there's this claim that the person who claims to have seen the vehicle apparently confronted Andy Colborn, the local investigator at the gas station and said, hey, um, yeah, that car that you're looking for, I saw it over here, and that apparently Colborn didn't do anything with it. That, that's the accusation. So it just throws another cloud of suspicion over this officer whose name has been dragged through the mud. Right. Since, the key guy, right? Since the key in, guy. Yeah, so the key, it, it all surrounds these two officers. They were accused by Avery's original attorneys, Buting and Strang, of planting the blood. Okay, so we've got the name of this officer back in, but but here's the thing that bugs me about it, okay? What bugs me about it is that the guy who claims he saw the car, this new witness, Mm -hmm. claims he didn't recognize the officer until he watched Making a Murderer, and that's when he recognized him. Now, I suppose in theory that's possible, but look, we were blasting those officers' pictures all over the airwaves in northeastern Wisconsin from way back before the trial. They were all over our TV station, everybody else's TV station, all the newspapers, and suddenly now this new witness claims he only recognizes the officer from the film. Yeah. That That's piece of that. because I, this is a little bit, Manitowoc is not that unlike Mayberry, right? You know, so you've got Barney Five and you've got Andy. And I, I, I mean Andy Griffith, not Andy Colburn. You know, there there are not that many detectives in Manitowoc County. So, as you say, you know, even if he didn't watch television and was living under a rock and didn't know about the Avery case, which would be very difficult to do in because it's somebody who's Yeah, because it's somebody who's texting a, a member of the family this information. Of, so it's somebody who's got to know the family. So this is, this is what I don't get about this, is, is why say you're a new witness, you saw the car, you told the officer, but you, you didn't say anything about it back then. You didn't say anything about it during either one of the two trials, wall-to-wall coverage all over everything. It's on the front page of the New York Times. You know, the New York Times is in town. Like, everybody's paying attention to this. You got these two officers' faces plastered all over everything leading up to the trial, at the trial, you name it. And only now you claim to recognize the officer. Something about that just doesn't sit horribly well with me. Well, and I don't disagree. I I see where you're coming from. Here's my overriding sort of observation about that. Um, And I say this all the time. I don't know that 
Andy Colburn planted the key. I have no information. I, I didn't see any evidence that suggested that he planted it. But I do know that that the Manitowoc and County Mac County Sheriff and DA got on TV and promised us that this was going to be an independent investigation. This is such a great lesson for law enforcement and prosecutors everywhere, mm -hmm. which is when even when it's inconvenient, you have to create that line in the sand because all of this problem, I mean, all these problems that they have are directly linked to the fact that they failed to keep the promise that they made to the public, which was there's a conflict of interest because Steve Avery's suing us. We're going to have somebody from the outside investigate. And the fact that, you know, two Manitowoc officers were the ones put in a position to be able to find this evidence really created this problem for them. Yes, exactly. Now, that, that's the thing that bugged me about this in the beginning. And if I'm remembering my history properly, I'm pretty sure that I did that story before you did, Colleen. Because, Rub it in. <laughs> um, when when we got the documents back from the courthouse that indicated that Manitowoc County was indeed on the crime scene, I went on TV and I think I was the first one to report that the promise had not been kept. And it was within a couple of weeks. You know, a judge swears out a warrant. The officers go investigate. They find the items. They have to provide the court back with a list of the items recovered within a, a time frame. And those documents came back with Manitowoc County signatures on them. And I, if I'm remembering this properly, and I remember sitting there in the newsroom saying, what? You know, how is this possible? We were told that they wouldn't be there. And then later, when it turned out that the officers with the direct conflicts found the key, that... I, I had a reaction in the newsroom, and I won't repeat it. Uh, it did involve me jumping up out of the chair, uh, probably <laughs> similar to your reaction when you found out Stephen Avery was the one who was being charged in the case. But, you know, now we've got, um, we've got this accusation. Maybe this person did see this. Maybe the person didn't recognize Andrew Colborn from the original coverage. But, you know, I have a hard time believing that because if you were following the case, you saw Andrew Colborn's picture all over the place. Yeah. So yeah. th that, that bothers I, I, You know, I, I don't, I don't disagree with. But on the other hand, think about it. You know, think about all the cases that you cover and how people, for whatever reasons they have, their deep dark secrets. You know, as simple as you know, well, that guy's my sister-in-law's brother, and I went to you know prom with his mom, and you know, you you just don't know what it is that drives people um, to keep secrets. Um, and and there's some about you know you spent a lot of time up there there uh is something uh i don't know kind of mysterious about that whole compound you know there's just these this family is so close-knit and so tightly um bound and linked to each other by their histories um that you know I, you know yeah this guy could be a relative remember uh, sandy morris the woman who said that steve Avery, you know, flashed at her and drove her off the road. Remember that? The woman yeah. uh, was convicted of driving her off the road, and uh, he was, you know, suggesting he was going to kidnap her and a baby and maybe kill her. Um, you know, she was a relative. It's 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 unbelievable the the level of you know, I don't know, relationships and uh, inter you know commingling of, of families up there that there may be some kind of family reason. Um, I'm not sure either. I, I have these questions. I'm just trying to look at what I have. We don't know who it is. Okay, there's just this accusation in this right. motion for reconsideration that somebody else saw the car. Um, not quite sure who it is. So that's interesting. But we can move on now to this point that you brought well, up a little bit. Sure. Let me make one observation though about okay. that, and I, I, it'll take us to the next thing too. Is I, I sort of feel from reading Zellner's motion and then the. 5,000 page one, you know, the various things that, that we've dealt with her, you know, the way she tweets, I, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, she's throwing spaghetti at a wall, right, in hoping that something sticks, uh, and it, it all it takes is one issue, right, to get her back into court, so she's just, you know, boom, 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 yeah, I personally you know. think that that can limit your credibility, when you start bringing up, you know, and I think I've seen a lot of laughing at her about the, uh, about the brain fingerprinting, and I know that this is technology that is, you know, that is developing. But a lot of people are like, huh, you know, really, you know, where you're damaging your own credibility by going so far out on a limb. 
Um, so that's, you know, that's, I'm, I'm guessing every single thing that she's learned, she's thrown into these motions and, and hopes that maybe one of them will get her, you know, if not in the Court of Appeals, ultimately into federal court and a habeas petition or something. Uh, that would seem to be the current trajectory, because my understanding is, is that she just doesn't think that this local judge is going to grant a new trial, which, you know, again, it's back and forth between what the goal of the representation is. At one point, it was a complete exoneration. Then it was a new trial. Okay, well, a new trial could in theory, in, in huge theory here, this is huge speculation, mm -hmm. result in a not guilty verdict, but you've got to have new evidence to get there. Okay, what constitutes new evidence? Discussions about that. Well, is it evidence that we've had that there's just different tests available now? Um, you know, and, you know, or is it someone who, um, you know, could have had information back when the case happened, but it was ignored? Uh, you know, what constitutes new evidence and I agree with your assessment. Look, she's trying to throw everything at the wall, but wh what is this? Is it an exoneration or is it a new trial? And a new trial doesn't necessarily mean not guilty either. So that's, that's uh, yet to be seen. But this other big accusation that came out, and, and again, I mean, she's, she's thrown multiple names around in this thing. The first time she filed a motion for a new trial, uh, she's throwing out the names of Teresa Halbeck's ex-boyfriend saying, well, maybe he was involved in some way. And a lot of people scratch their head about that one. Well, the new one now is that there's pornography on this computer. Well, we knew about that from back during the original case, okay? Um, and she's saying that it somehow implicates uh, one other member of the Dassey family. So not Brendan Dassey, not mm -hmm. the nephew who was convicted of playing a role whose case is up on appeal, okay, in front of the, the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, not him, but one of his brothers. And the way that she stitches the argument together really bothered me because it's um, it's sort of like we've got questionable content on this computer, uh, we've got violent pornography, and this stuff's disgusting. It's in the motion. Uh, you probably saw it. I probably saw it. And uh, at least a little tiny thumbnails that she attached to the court document. Mm -hmm. But it's you know, does that necessarily prove who was looking at it? Because a lot of people had access to this computer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think it raises a really good question about it. And one of the things that bothers me, and I think that's largely because, well, I am still a journalist, but, you know, defamation is a big deal. There's a lot of power when, you know, you, you utter words, especially when they're going to be widely disseminated. And I know she's protected in saying these things because they're in court records uh, and she's got immunity. Um, but it, it is troubling, and I felt that way about, about Teresa Halbach's ex-boyfriend, um, who, by the way, you know, works, he's, as we all know, uh, works here in Milwaukee, and, you know, has been getting all kinds of, from my understanding, all kinds of threats, because, you know, after the making a murder, you know, they were, you go on Reddit, and, you know, there are the conspiracy theories that, you know, he, that the ex-boyfriend did it, and, um, and so where he was working, they had to take action to make sure that, you know, to protect him, and, and this isn't, you know, while it is television, and it is in some measure, uh, so people consider it entertainment. It, it isn't when you're the subject of it. So, you know, I, I feel I feel for him. I feel for the other members of the, you know, the Dassey family, you know, the other brothers. I don't know, you know, maybe maybe they did get the wrong brother. There's certainly no DNA. There's really uh, nothing but Brendan Dassey's statement to put him at the scene of, scene of the homicide. Um, but... Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you, Kathleen. I mean, look, I mean, I... I know that when, as you said, when things are put into court documents, they ultimately uh, carry a privilege. So, yeah, she can wing the accusations. And by she, I mean Kathleen Zellner, Stephen Avery's post-conviction attorney. But, um, you know, at this point, reporting on this story, which I am still doing from here, and mm -hmm. you're still doing it locally, you know, we, we've got a lot of accusations flying here, and some of them give me pause because some of them just don't line up with what I know about the case, and they don't line up with what my initial suspicions were about the case. Mm -hmm. And I think that you got into that area just a little bit. Um, you know, our initial concerns, and, and I, perhaps I can speak for you, and, and if you think I'm, I'm wrong, tell me, no, Aaron, you're an idiot. But the initial concern that I think raised all of our eyebrows was exactly the one that you said, was the promise that there would be an independent investigation because of a police conflict of interest and the promise was not honored. That was what raised everybody's eyebrows, at least in the press corps, 
at mm -hmm. least on my behalf, and I think you agree with me on your behalf, that was what really concerned everybody. And then later when we had uh, Brendan Dassey arrested, what concerned me was the level of detail. The special prosecutor, Ken Kratz, sat there. I think you were there. I was there um, for that. And just listening to that just disgusted me. So it's like you've got a potential police investigation with conflict of interest running all the way through it, up and down, no legal mechanism to deal with it, just a promise mm -hmm. that's then broken. And then you've got this tainting of the jury pool by making the allegations, uh, some would say, as heinous as possible in the court of public opinion. And this is a year before the jury is, is set. And, you know, I, I am, you know, get into process discussions all the time here on Law News, but that process bothered me. And, you know, now we've got these accusations flying all over the place. So, you know, I don't know, was the ex-boyfriend involved? I have no evidence to suggest yeah. that he was. I don't remember any evidence coming out that would suggest that he was, other than we've got accusations coming from a defense attorney. We don't have right. evidence. So I think that's the, and the one observation I would make about uh, where things will go now, you know, in terms of this process, um, Kathleen Zellner is asking the judge to reconsider. Um, and, and it's possible that she may, because the one thing that I think is surprised people here in Wisconsin was that she never got a response from the state to Zellner's, you know, 5,000 page motion. You know, she, they didn't, and there had been a stipulation to have additional testing. So, um, you know, it's possible she may reconsider and then hold hearings, at which point it would be very interesting if we didn't hear from the ex-boyfriend, they put the ex-boyfriend on the stand and they put, you know, the other brother on and the other brother who, uh, the brother who said that he saw Hall box car off the property, you know. Uh, so there, there, there would be all kinds of new testimony, and if nothing else, you'd get a sense of whether it was credible or not. Because really, all it is is, is paper, you know. At this point, and, um, you know, you remember listening to some of these people on the stand during the trials. You know, it sounded like really damning evidence until you heard them speak, you know, and you realized, okay, the jury's probably not going to buy what these people are are selling. Um, well, you know, yeah, the credibility look, I mean, is so personality. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. And, and I agree. You know, look, we talk about accusation versus proof. And the whole point of having a trial is to get that witness up on the stand and for independent people to weigh whether or not what that witness is saying is believable. Mm -hmm. And I think that there were a number of um, so eye rolling just... sessions from those of us that were sitting downstairs from that courtroom watching things come across on the feed. Some of it involved law enforcement. Somebody that I worked with who I won't name because the person is still a journalist in Wisconsin just said, I don't know if I believe these uh, officers that had the conflict of interest. And, you know, the role of the jury is to assess the demeanor of the witnesses and try to determine whether or not the witness is telling the truth. Right. And uh, we don't have that at this stage in this yet. We have accusations. Some of them are pretty bombastic if they're true. The question is if they're true. And the overriding thing I thought uh, during the trial, uh, I really thought the thing that won the day for the state was was the DNA evidence. You know, that, that people may have been, the jurors may have been very suspicious about, you know, the, the Manitowoc officers, uh, but you know, they watch CSI, right? And everybody knows DNA is, you know, like a slam dunk. And so, and, you know, they, they weighed, you know, officer credibility, they weighed DNA, and they went with science. And I remember thinking at the time and saying at the time that if we come back, you know, on appeal, the, the issue is going to be the DNA. And uh, and, and you'll remember, you know, especially for those of your viewers who, who watched the Making a Murderer thing, was the FBI uh, guy they brought in at the end, sort of the end uh, of the trial, where they brought him in and had him uh, give the results of some very quickly uh, determined results of this test to determine whether or not there was a preservative in the DNA that, uh, you know, DNA that Stephen Avery's DNA, and if there were, it would have suggested it came out of a test tube and was planted. Um, by the police. And the guy from the FBI um, got on the stand and said, uh, yeah, we did this protocol and we got it done quickly, even though we said we weren't going to be able to get it done in time. And there he was speaking with the full faith and credit of the FBI. And he said, I have determined that there was no preservative in this DNA. 
Uh, so therefore, it really was Steve Avery's blood. It was not planted. And I thought that was the death knell for Stephen Avery. I heard that and I thought, you know, this jury is going to take this guy, you know, with his PhD from the, you know, Conoco, and they're going to say, you know, why would he lie? Um, and that, but to me at the time, you'll remember the defense was out of its mind that this testimony was even allowed because it hadn't had the opportunity to do its own testing. Um, and I thought, you know, that's that to me was going to be where the whole appeal was going to potentially have some traction because, yeah. si you know, especially science is just so advancing. I mean, so I, I always assumed that it would. And, and look, you know, you, you had Zellner retest it, and apparently that came back. She was trying to figure out the age of the sample, not whether or not the preservative was present. Right. And, you know, look, there's issues about EDTA. It's in a bunch of stuff. It's in shampoo. Who's? It's in. I think it's in. Uh, you know, car cleaner. So it's like if there's EDTA on the blood, doesn't necessarily mean that it came out of the vial. It, it you know, it just may be present. It may not. There are other courts that have looked at this stuff and said the testing for it is just flat out not reliable because it's in a million and two things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's just one reason. And because the tests themselves have have not held up in uh, as reliable in other situations. I, I kind of agree. I thought that this was potentially going to drift off into some other realm of testing. Maybe the test would be perfected in the future. And if Stephen Avery was going to get off the hook on this, it was going to be the result of some additional test on the blood sample from the car. But that's not the tactic that Kathleen Zellner is taking because her mm -hmm. testing indicates that the sample was fresh, if I'm remembering properly. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that whole area just kind of got dialed back. Yeah, it's fascinating. And then this whole you know, testing the the hood latch, you know, they had 15 people touch a hood latch and see what they left behind. And I mean, you know, it's riveting reading. I mean, especially if you're, you know, kind of junkies like we are. Um, but again, without having had the opportunity to hear what the state, you know, it's the state's rebuttal of this evidence and not, of course, ever having had any opportunity to, you know, have any kind of a hearing, it's, it's hard to take it at face value. You know, that's not what an ad, you know, an adversarial system is about. I'd really love to see this hearing, and there's some some thought that this judge may reconsider only uh, because there had been this stipulation, and the state never really had an opportunity to weigh in and say, "Oh, judge, we you know we think this is a bad idea." And she, you know, it, so potentially maybe she will hold a hearing, um, which I think would be it would, it would well it would be very interesting to put. Kathleen Zellner really in a courtroom setting, you know, as opposed to Twitter. Um, uh, you know, she's just an interesting attorney to cover. I mean, I've never covered anybody who um, approaches, I mean, obviously this is an extremely high profile case. She got in when it was extremely high profile. She, um, you know, she's a very adept um, public relations person. And uh, so it would be very interesting to see her have to put her legal skills to work, uh, you know, in a, in a courtroom as well. Yeah, I think this could be very, very interesting. If there is that hearing, I uh, look forward to competing against you yet again. Yeah. Um, because uh, what's, uh, what's better but to have that? Um, so, you know, look, again, just a reminder procedurally where we are, folks. Uh, there was a motion for a new trial. It was denied. There's been a motion to reconsider with some new evidence filed recently in the Making a Murderer case. That's why we're having the discussion. Colleen Henry, former competitor, uh, we have participated in some live chats. We, you can hear both of us yelling questions out in the background of press conferences and making a murderer. Colleen, it's always good to chat with you again. All right, good to see ya. Oh, and by the way, I have never failed to have been impressed, and this day included in that, at your ability to wear your station's color scheme in whatever you have donned <laughs> on a particular day. I remember- I to my boss. Blue coats uh, at the courthouse, uh, now yeah. blue blazers. So you you get a star for that. Team player. <laughs> All right, Colleen, good to see good you. Good to see you, Aaron. Okay, take care.